Hey, everybody. Welcome. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. I'm Joe McCall, and I got some special guests that I have wanted to get on the podcast for a long, long time. And I finally got them here, Jason and Rachel. And uh, But first, I just wanted to uh, do a few announcements. Ha-ha. This podcast is brought to you by my book, REI Secrets, Daily Nuggets of Real Estate Investing Wisdom to help you get more leads and close more deals. You can get this for free. Look at this thickness of, aren't you impressed, Jason? That's, that's a real book, book man. Very yeah. impressive. That's a real book. <laughs> Size doesn't matter. I know what you're thinking, Jason. But like <laughs> this book is free. You can get it at reisecrets.com, reisecrets.com. And uh, just daily nuggets of investing wisdom. So like each chapter is about two or three pages long. And uh, just some daily thoughts that you can read every day while you're sitting on the pot. And uh, just get some ideas of what you can do with the business. I've got my bad humor going on today because, because Jason and I go back and forth like this all the time. And it's just kind of fun. So anyway. We're, we're glad to be here, man. I'm glad you're here too. Um, so Jason Roberts and Rachel Schneider, uh, you're both in St. Louis. You've been in the business a long time. And uh, you guys are business partners. And uh, you're doing some pretty awesome things and you've got an amazing story. And uh, I was wondering if you guys could um, tell me about your story, your history, and uh, that'll give us some context of what uh, I want to ask you about in terms of marketing, right? Like, I love the marketing business. That's what you guys are really known for in real estate. Um, some real cutting edge marketing. You do a lot of it. You're good at it. You have had a lot of success with your clients. Uh, with marketing. And so I want to really spend most of our time talking about marketing, but can you go back first a little bit, Jason and Rachel, talk about kind of where you came from and, and uh, how'd you get into the business? Well, man, that's a, that's an interesting story. I, I don't know that we really uh, set out on the real estate investing side. Rachel and I opened a mortgage company at a really young age. I was 21. She was 18. And um, I think it was kind of timing was a big part of it. You know, we opened that company in 2001. So it was kind of at the start of the refi boom that we're really, I mean, really technically still experiencing right now. Right. I mean, I don't think rates have really ever gone back up since then. And so we, we kind of lucked into that, but it was a lot of hard work, a lot of hours, um, a lot of hours, a lot of 5 30 AM till midnight days. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of, took that nothing and turned it into something. We grew that company to around a hundred employees. Um, it became a, a big operation, a very profitable operation. And, you know, I think we kind of felt like that was going to be what we were, you know, where, our future. yeah, it was our future. Yeah. And then uh, one day in 2007 came and uh, one day, one day, one day. And, you know, we went from, bringing in millions of dollars a year to losing 60, 70 grand a month for a period of about two and a half years. Um, you know, when you have an operation that size and the money stops coming in, it doesn't mean the expenses stop going out. And we found ourselves in a place where, uh, you know, for about two and a half years, we lost a significant amount of money every month until there was no more money left to lose. I, you know, I found my Myself in foreclosure, I lost my own home to foreclosure, cars repoed, chapter seven bankrupt. Uh, I mean, just as, as as bad as you can financially be destroyed, that's where, uh, I think that's where we both were at that time. And it wasn't uh, wasn't financial mismanagement or, or anything else. It's just, you know, when you, when you lose 60 grand a month for two and a half years straight, it doesn't really matter how much money you have in your savings or how much, you know, how well you've thought things out. Um, there was no stopping that, you know, hindsight, looking back on it, maybe uh, we could have just took our chips off the table and, and went a different direction. But when you're in the middle of it, you don't. Uh, you're still fighting for yeah. that future that you worked so hard. Um, to well, I want to ask you more questions about that. Because um, Jason, you tell a story of your car is getting repoed and you're at the Midwest Bank Center, I think, right? Yep, in, exactly in where it was. Yep. Haven. And your employees are at the window looking out the window down into the parking lot, right? And what are they looking at? Man, I, I mean, I very, very clearly remember me playing like, let's make a deal with the repo man. Cause you know, when you, I, I had ran inside and in the car was my phone and my laptop and probably house keys and uh, 
you know, everything else that you may randomly have in your car and, you know, we're playing. license plates. Yeah. Right. Maybe, maybe some plates. I might've had plates at that time. I think, I think you I had did. license plates. Yeah. yeah. Not um, today, but then, yeah. Nine years strong, Joe. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. So your employee, I'm sorry, your employees though, were at the, at the window watching your car get repoed. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm shoving all my stuff into a black trash bag and it's raining. And I mean, it was like out of a movie, you know, and I, I, I remember walking back into the building with that bag on my shoulder and looking up and, you know, Midwest bank centers on the third floor. There's, it's a pretty decent size office complex. There's a lot of people that work in there. And yeah. I just remember seeing all those people kind of watch it and thinking, man, what the hell happened? You know, what, what happened? What, where, oh. where do we, where do we go from here? You know? No, why, why did you guys, wait so long like what what were you thinking at the time and how would you have done it differently today i, I mean for me it was um maybe it's going to be better tomorrow maybe it's going to be better tomorrow maybe things are going to change tomorrow no one no one really knew you know um at the beginning of 2007 there were around 3700 licensed mortgage companies or mortgage banks in the state of missouri wow. in 2010 there were less than 300 Wow. So, I mean, it was like a 90 something percent reduction right. in an industry uh, within a year or two. I mean, everyone went under, but. I think you, I think there was also the mindset of sometimes that's business, right? Like you have those ebbs and flows. And so this can only last for so long. You know, it, it wasn't just our industry. It was a, yeah. a an economy thing that had, yeah. you know, and it's like at some point this has to turn around and don't quit. You know, we're not, we're not quitters. And so we've got to stick with this. We know that this can come on the other side. And when it does, you know, competition will be weeded out and we will be those ones who, who made it. And we even, um, at one point we did start transitioning into doing some loan modifications because so many of our clients that we'd had for years were now incapable of getting refinances, um, to pull yeah. out money, to pay off other debt, or even to, um, keep up with their mortgage payment. And so we started kind of trying to do that to help them, but that didn't help them. It didn't get anywhere. You know, that, that also then started to, to bleed us a little bit as well. What would you have done differently today? Would you have, would you have pulled the plug earlier or? Uh, that's a, that's a good question, man. Um, I, I guess one big thing for me is the debt part. Um, we operate our personal lives and all of our businesses today completely debt free. Yes. It, you know, it, we didn't have an, an exorbitant amount of debt tied to that business, but you know, we might've had a half million dollars worth of printers and scanners and fax machines that were on lease payments. Um, Cause that's how you purchase things. That, and you that's know, it was like what, how you got them. Yeah. That's what every smart, smart uh, CPA and lawyer and everything advice us to do is, you know, you guys need deductions, you need write-offs, you need expenses, you know, you're a cash heavy business. You need to, you need to be able to have things to expense. Awesome. We could have yeah. written a check um, at any point for everything in there, but I, I that would be a big lesson, Joe, is that I, I wouldn't finance things. I wouldn't roll stuff up. I wouldn't put the company, you know, I would prepare the company that if income quit coming in today, it wouldn't really have negatively impact us yeah. other than, you know, other than that, but but it wouldn't be a negative cash flow situation, I guess. How do you how do you manage your overhead today? Oh man, we're um, we're very financially structured today. So we actually teach this, you know, financially setting up your business, and so we call it our financial buckets. And there is an there is a line item for every expense. Every expense has a certain amount of months of reserves that we keep in there down to even our incomes, to our health insurance, to our retirement plans. You know, we could pay our employees for the next eight months and not bring in a dime and so wow. and still be okay. And so we intentionally, I think from what we went through, we no, no. intentionally made sure that our business was always set up. I mean, we both just got credit cards, uh, one credit card each like three months ago so we could start getting points for all this travel that we do <laughs> because we've just been so anti, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's so that's how we are today. We're just, we're very financially disciplined and there is, there is a line item for every expense that we have in the business. And we even take it to the point that, you know, we have a lot of ideas, you know, Jason's a huge idea guy. And so 
we have oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> we have a bucket that's just for that, you know, for the things that we're going to test and try, whether it's 2020 or 2021, every dollar that comes in, there's certain percentages that go to all these different line items that just keep building that up for us. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, you guys run a you 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 run a pretty lean ship. You know, I don't know how many times I've seen you in uh, bread company, yeah. Panera. <laughs> you guys take up half the restaurant. No, I'm just kidding. But like that's that's one of your offices, isn't it? I mean, you just you really keep it lean. You 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 manage. This is one thing I really admire about you guys is you really really manage your overhead and your team, and you coach and help people do the same thing. That's important, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, cool. I know I'm, maybe I'm breaking up a little bit on your end. I apologize about that, but you guys sound good to me. So we're, I think we're good. Okay. You sound really good. Okay. Um, talk about guys, um, what happened after that? All right. So did you finally close the doors? Where, what kind of financial situation were you in? So, I mean, we were in the worst financial situation. Um, I, my chapter seven bankruptcy was October of 2010. Um, like Rachel said, we had kind of started into the loan mod arena like 2009 because it was, uh, we actually grew the loan mod side of the company pretty big. And, you know, when the government gave out that TARP money, there were, there were, if you applied correctly for a loan mod, there was a good chance if it was structured correctly that you would, you would get approved. And then one day, kind of like the mortgage business, the government just quit, you know, the banks quit approving loan mods no matter what. So we went from having a very successful product to kind of overnight. Um, and all that was really doing, Joe, was keeping us afloat. It, yes. it wasn't- um, I was gonna say, I don't know that I'd say success, but I think if you looked at that side of the business, you would say success, but for how we were bleeding on the other end, it, yep. it wasn't outweighing. It was, yeah. it was keeping us afloat. Um, yeah. We never actually officially had to close the mortgage company. It, 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 at the time that we were completely wiped out, nothing. Um, that's when the market kind of started to change and, and get better again. And Rachel and I, I think, kind of looked at each other and, you know, it was, it, there was so much pain associated with that downturn and having everything. I mean, when you literally watch everything that you've ever worked for in your entire life be stripped out of your hands right in front of your face and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, there's a, a certain level of pain that you associate to the fact that, you know, we were like, I don't know what we're going to do, but heck with that, man, that sucked. You know, I, I'm tired of working 80 hours a week. I'm tired of the grind. And like, it was all worth it when things were good, but when they weren't good anymore, it's like, you know what? I don't know. It was, it was honestly the best thing that ever happened to me. I to was going to say, it's the biggest that, blessing. Yeah. That we could really step outside of that and see that this isn't the way we want our lives to be. This isn't the way we want our lives to look. Mm -hmm. And that was the same month, same month that I filed the bankruptcy was the same month that Sean was teaching uh, short sale wealth boot camp in St. Sean, Louis. Sean McCloskey. Yep. And I didn't know him at the time. Um, it was the first and only time that he's ever done that. I don't know if you remember that particular boot camp, but it was the first and only time he'd ever done that for free. Really? And had it not been free, we wouldn't have been there. So um, I remember that. And he lost a ton of money at that event. Yes, yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> um, but thankfully for his loss was our gain. Yeah. Um, we, uh, thank you, Sean. Wow. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Um, because we would not have been there if we had to pay a couple thousand bucks or something, wow. you know, we wouldn't have, um, we would have been there now, but we wouldn't have been there then because we didn't have it to spend. And man, we just, you know, one thing about business and having success in business is, you know, I think when you really deeply understand the fundamentals that make a business successful, the type of business is really just the vehicle or the product, you know, the, the mechanics of it is, is what works. And so we, while we lost everything financially, what we didn't lose is all the knowledge we had gained over the last 10 years of, of running a very successful business. And so I think we took those core principles and applied them to Sean's blueprint for real estate and said, okay, if this guy's done 400 deals, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just copy exactly what he's doing in his business on a daily basis and, and, and see if we can make it better, see if we can tweak it. But at the, at its core, let's just do the, the key things that he's doing on a daily basis and achieve the same result. Right. So that was, uh, what year was that? It was the end of 2010, um, and, and 2011. So, I mean, we really went from literally being completely bankrupt and, and wiped out um, to the point we really couldn't even afford direct mail um, to we closed 111 deals in 2011. 
111 short sale deals. Yeah. Yep. You didn't have the money for marketing. What'd you do? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you exactly what we did, man. We, uh, we took the foreclosure data, right? The, the list. And we ran it through whitepages.com because we couldn't afford a good skip trace engine. So literally whitepages.com, we did a reverse address search on whitepages.com. So there were about 150 foreclosure filings a day at that time. Wow. And in St. Louis, our, our radius from where we're at, five you know, counties, St. five yeah. counties, St. St. Louis County, St. Charles, Warren, Lincoln, Jefferson. Um, and out of those 150 people, we would find maybe 75 phone numbers on white pages. And out of those 75 phone numbers, probably only 20 or 30 of them, probably 20 of them were good. Um, but every day we got another 20 and another 20, and another 20. Wow. So, you know, after a week we had a hundred good numbers. After two weeks we had 200 good numbers. And I mean, we literally just hammered the phone. I mean, I could, I could say it verbatim. I mean, I'd just call every number. Hey, it's Jason Roberts. I saw your house is coming up for foreclosure sale here in the next couple of weeks. And I was just calling to see if you're interested in keeping it, if you're trying to get out from under it or what exactly you're trying to do. Same thing every single time. And just open up the conversation, you know, just people overcomplicate real estate investing. Sometimes I think with, you know, at our core, the, the, the main thing we're trying to do is just have a conversation with people who might be interested in selling their house. Yeah. That's, and, that's all it is, isn't it? It's just, um, it's a people business mm -hmm. and, um, it's about relationships for sure. All right. So you started doing a lot of short sales. How long did that last? Oh man. Mm -hmm. I got, I got short sales going right now. So, I mean, we've always, we've always been in that investing strategy. Personally for me, it is my favorite investing strategy. So when you, well, let's define what short sales mean to you. Are you getting paid to um, negotiate the short sale with the bank? Or are you getting paid by um, negotiating, buying it and then flipping it and selling it? How does that work? Yeah, so it's pre-foreclosure data is what you're pulling. That's the data source that you use. And um, at that time when we started, you know, every property was underwater because of where the market was at. Um, but even today, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that the home is not worth what the value is. Um, and so when we first started out, we only negotiated for ourselves. Um, and then we actually grew into a, into a business where we negotiated for other people. We negotiated directly with the bank. And that's where that short sale side actually comes into um, I haven't personally touched a negotiation in a couple of years because it's time consuming, but it's well worth every minute that you put into it from, I've not seen higher profit checks come from a different type of investing strategy than through the short sales. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, uh, like Rachel said, you know, it was, we were negotiating our own deal. So yeah. we, we were doing it to flip. Um, we were doing it to, to make the margin. And I think kind of as that grew, um, and as we, you know, started speaking and teaching other people how we were having success in this business. We started finding a lot of people that said, Hey, you know, I've got these deals and you taught me how to negotiate it, but man, that Why doesn't sound do like fun. Stuff? How about yeah. we send it to you? And so it, it, it further, you know, kind of, I remember uh, Sean asking us to share at his boot camp, and we were kind of, I don't really want to share our secrets. You know, I don't really want to share what, uh, what's really working well for us and have everybody doing the same thing. And I remember him kind of saying, you know, you can, you can choose to have a scarcity mindset or you can choose to have an abundant mindset. And I didn't at the time understand how teaching everyone else how to have the success that we were having was going to be a benefit to us. Um, but we did it and mm -hmm. you know, exactly what Rachel said, you know, yeah. we, we started to find a lot of other relationships with people who said, Hey, I'll find the deal. How about, you guys already have the machine. You already have the engine. Put it in your pipeline. So it, it just added another stream of income for us that wasn't there before. Yeah. Awesome. So what what is your real estate side of the business look like today? The last couple of three years, you've been really busy doing a lot of deals. What kind of volume are you guys doing? And uh, then I want to ask you about the kind of marketing that you're doing. You broke up a little bit there, Joe, but... Um, this last year, we really focused on, for the first time really ever in our business, we really started to focus on some multifamily acquisition, which is new for us. Yes. Um, we've always been in the single family fix and flip or wholesale you know, side of the business. Um, the multifamily stuff was foreign to us, but as we're kind of 
looking at our own futures, you know, we have a hard money lending business and that's really Rachel and I's retirement. Um, the money that, that we make in, in profit in there, we try to reinvest it back out. And we were to a point where we said, Hey, you know, we can deploy some of these funds into something that pays us a check every month because mm -hmm. our business is very transactional, right? Um, we, we don't get paid unless we do deals. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, what, what, what happens in time where maybe if we don't want to do deals anymore. And so it was kind of a focus on multifamily. We did some really cool apartment building acquisitions this last year that uh, were fun to do, exciting yeah. to do. Um, big are these, are these big multifamily deals or smaller deals? Um, big to us, like a 24 unit. Um, yeah. Which is, yeah. which is, is big for us. I mean, we have, you know, you have the people who take are taking down hundreds and hundreds of units and stuff like that. Um, and we've looked at some of those and would definitely get into that arena. It's just those numbers making sense and being perfect for us. Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, are you still doing houses? Are you doing, what kind of marketing are you doing now for single family homes or, or, or this normal, are you still doing any wholesaling fix and flips? Yeah, absolutely. We really, at this point, um, after we kind of transitioned, you know, that first year where we did those 111 deals, we did not rehab any of them. Um, we were we were wholesale and everything. The most we ever did to one of those properties was maybe run a cleaning crew through it. Um, other than that, you know, we had to build our capital back up. And so we were in and out of every transaction. And then we really grew into um, investing into probate deals. And so we started pulling that data and pushing that out. Um, at one point, HUD had a decent inventory, and so we would purchase those properties through there. Um, so we've kind of reduced our range for marketing just for a time sake for us, but we're still very much in that probate world, um, sprinkle in some eviction, different types of marketing here and there too. Um, currently, we're not doing anything with, with local banks, but we have yeah. you know, a few years ago, we were doing some stuff with local banks also. Are you guys doing any um, direct mail right now or cold calling? Not direct mail per se. Um, are you are you doing any on the short sale side? No, I'm not doing it on the short sale. Yeah. I'm I'm all outbound calls right now. I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of the just get in front of the customer as fast as you can and and by as many means as you can. Yes. You know, I think one of the one of the things that I wish everybody understood at a deeper level about marketing is that you know one of the reasons we did 111 deals in 2011 in a market where everyone was marketing to short sales is that we didn't just only do one dimensional marketing. You know, we were, we were in their mailbox, we were in their voicemail, we were in their Facebook, Facebook inbox, we were in their email, we were on their front doorstep. I mean, we hit them from a million different angles and were able to produce, you know, a 10 to 20% response rate as opposed to, a one dimensional method only not to, I mean, direct mail still works, but at the end of the day, direct mail still is a, is a one to 2% response rate. So it, it. And mail doesn't carry the same weight that I feel like it did years ago. We, we still very much teach it. It is definitely part of our like multi-touch lead exhaustion that we teach, but we, you have to find out what people's preferred way of communication is. And I want to push everything out to determine which one of that's gonna be. you know, For someone it's going to be the mail, but today we live in a world where bills are auto, you know, auto withdrawn and all those things, you're not running out to the mailbox every day necessarily. Yep. Anymore, anymore I just send my kids to go get the mail. Right. <laughs> right, about once a week. Yep. But uh, yeah, we're still doing direct mail ourselves and it is working. We're finding uh, work. calling is, is working the best for us. Yes. Uh, we're doing some texting as well, but what other, what other types of marketing are you seeing that's working well today for you and for your students? Man, we're, we're a big fan of voice broadcast. Um, I consistently see a 10% response rate on voice, you know, ringless voicemail Yeah. Um, across all markets across the country. So, you know, we always teach, get your data. The very first thing you do when the data comes in is run it through, through a good skip trace. Um, we need alternative contact than just the, the information that we can pull from the county courthouse or whatever. So immediately run it through skip, hit it with slide broadcast, hit it with text message, hit it with email, hit it inside of social media. Um, 
because we never know for sure, right? I mean, a, a good percent of the phone numbers we get can be disconnected or incorrect. Um, we don't know for sure we have the right email. Um, and just kind of the old 80% of sales happen after the fifth contact. So let's try to get to five as fast as we can. Uh, it was our thought kind of behind it. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Um, are you, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Multi-touch mark. Oh yeah, list. Like who, what kind of lists are you pulling and then skip tracing? Yeah, so for us, we're, I'm, I'm a big fan of just straight to the source. So I think so many people fail to realize that a lot of the data that we use as real estate investors is public knowledge. So the pre-foreclosure list, there are so many either, you know, direct links through the, your county courthouse, um, or even some of some states have a statewide site that you can pull that information through, or some type of a legal newspaper that's getting a direct feed from from the county. So Missouri Lawyers Media is what we're, you know, what we use here, and that covers most of our counties actually. Um, the probate, the exact same thing, you know, for us here in Missouri, we have CaseNet, and that is a court online court system. You know, Wisconsin has one. There's a lot of states that have them. And we pull that data straight from there. And not that I don't like a list provider, I don't like the delay that that causes. And if you're in my market and I'm your competition, I'm always going to get there before you because there's no delay in me being able to pull that data. Um, same with the evictions. That's a straight straight feed for us off of that, that case net site. And the local banks is a simple Google search. Um, and that's really not data that we refresh yeah. that often. But I have students that have success with, you know, some vacant list properties and stuff like um, in particular, just did a coaching call yesterday that they're pulling crazy off of that. Um, but when you look at them, a lot of them were, were probates that kind of turned into these vacant properties, you know. I don't know, Joe, you know more about this than, than us, but we're seeing a lot of our students that are having a really good success right now with Facebook ads. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're actually running Facebook ad spend for lead gen um, for sellers and yeah. doing really, really well. Very with it. well, yes. I, one of the things I've been hearing about, um, well, first of all, before I get to Facebook ads, because I want to talk about that, um, pre-foreclosures, we were talking about that earlier. Are you starting to see that rise back up again? Yeah. Yep. Isn't that crazy? How long have you been seeing it come back up? It has, it has definitely been, I feel like the last six to nine months, and it all depends on what market you're in, right? Like how you're seeing it. Um, but there are certain states that are saying that they're going to increase by like 80% in the wow. next, you know, six to 12 months, which that's an enormous number, you know, and whether they're right or they're not, there's definitely going to be, gonna an, be increase. an increase, you know. So what do you what are you recommending to people now that we're starting to see that? What do they need to learn? What you know, what do they need to do to take advantage of that? You need to find a proven system for it because it is a more complex strategy, you know, just being completely honest, but it's absolutely possible. Um, and, and start now. I, I think the reason yeah. I had said earlier what I really love, why it's my favorite investing strategy is because. Um, I've not found another one that allows me to build a pipeline of properties and I'm not guaranteed that they're all going to close. Right. But after, after a while, and I build enough of a pipeline, it's a math equation that a certain percent I can start to count on. That's going to turn, you know, I'm going to lose a certain percent, but I'm going to close a certain percent too. So your only focus right now is just building the pipeline. Don't worry about those ones that you lose just keep building it. And if you don't have the personality type to do the negotiations, outsource it because that's, you can go on all the homeowner appointments you want, but if you mess that part up, you'll never see. That's the biggest complaint I hear from people why they push back on that strategy is because it's not a fit for their personality. Outsource that. So, okay. Have short sales gotten easier over the years? Um, you, you know, I, I want to say, Yes. Um, but I think with experience, things always seem easier, right? We've learned so many tricks um, and have developed relationships and contacts that help us negotiating in our, our own deals as well as other people's deals, right? So um, I would say you bring up a good point on, yeah. on the education part of it. You know, um, most other strategies, not all, but most other strategies, you know, we're, we're writing a contract and we're negotiating with the seller and then we go to the closing table. Yeah. Um, it's not ultra complex. The short sales side, I mean, 
we used to teach a, a four day event just on negotiating a short sale, you know? Um, there's a, a, a lot that goes into putting that package together correctly. And I mean, just stupid stuff as simple as, you know, if, if they are unemployed or, you know, they're not receiving income right now and you don't write a letter, uh, a letter of explanation just simply for their income that says, I am not currently receiving a paycheck and you submit that file, the lender's automatically gonna decline it and they may not tell you why. And so as an investor, you say, short sales suck. I mean, these things are hard. They don't, they don't ever get approved. Right when really it was, it was your method of submission that caused it to not get improved, but you don't know that, you know? So I, I think Rachel brought up a really good point is, is start paying attention to it now so that when this shift occurs, when this change happens, you're so ready. You hit the ground running, you know? Um, it's definitely on our radar that we would absolutely flip that switch back on as we start to see that turn, you we'd, know? We'd turn it up, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Good, good. Um, so you guys are, you're starting to teach a lot more. You've been doing that for a few years now and you have a lot of really successful students. One of the th favorite things that I've used a lot, Jason, that I've heard you say before, and I actually heard Sean McCloskey say that you said this. Um, you made a list of everything that you need to do in a business and you ask yourself a simple question, which is what? You remember what I'm talking about? I do. We just talked about it lunch the other day, but I don't remember specifically what you're referencing. How can I do none of this, right? It's just, I, maybe I'm misquoting you for having saying that, I don't know. But ever since Sean McCloskey told me that, it's really radically changed my thinking. Like listing all that you gotta do and thinking, how can I do none of this? How can I get systems and people to replace me and do this for me so that I'm not the clog that's, that's tying everything up, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because um, it's had a huge impact on me and my business. And as I've taught this stuff over the years as well, myself, it's made a big difference in a lot of other people. Man, uh, yeah, I, I think that we, that was something we learned. I mean, we've been self-employed for, gosh, um, 19 years now. Wow. And for the first 10 or 12 of it, we did, a, I mean, we did a lot of things right, but we did a lot of things wrong, man. I mean, we ran a successful business, but it, it, we were a slave to it. I mean, it was a 12-hour workday every single day. So I think that somewhere along that line, you know, we decided we don't want this business to run our life anymore. And it came, it came down to, you know, I think every entrepreneur, no matter how big the company is, even a Fortune 500 company, you know, you're, you're only as big is the owner's ability to to delegate or to to be able to just keep themselves where they're super super strong and i think as we started to learn more about what her strengths were what my strengths were and then look at ourselves and say this isn't what we're the best at you know and one of the one of the things that really got me thinking about that was one of my coaches back when we had the short sale business said you know what I was kind of sharing, yeah, we're making a lot of money and things are good, but I'm not super happy. And he said, well, why are you happy? I said, well, I think because I'm doing a lot of things that I don't really like to do. And he said, okay, well, well, why don't you just work for the next month or two on changing your business where you're only doing the part that you really, really like? What's the part that you really like? And I said, well, I, I like the homeowner appointment. You know, that's, that's kind of my favorite part. And so he said, all right, let's, let's, why don't you build the business in a way you only do the homeowner appointment? So over the next couple of months, we really transitioned it to where my only job was meet with homeowners. So, I mean, I'd have a 10 o'clock, a 12 o'clock, a two o'clock and a four o'clock. You know, I mean, I would just meet with sellers all day long. And after a couple of months, we sat down again and he said, you know, hey, how's it going? I was like, it's, it's going good. And he said, are, are you happier? And I really thought about that. I'm like, you know what? I don't really like this either. Uh, you know, I mean, like I, I, it was a really crazy, weird feeling. And, and I felt like um, I'm not being ungrateful. I'm not being unappreciative. Like I, I I'm, I'm blessed that we have a business again and we have money again, but I'm not like fulfilled and happy. And that's when it really hit me for the first time ever that I enjoy the building. I enjoy the creation. I enjoy the, the visionary. Um, I enjoy the challenge, but I don't necessarily enjoy long-term running any spot on the assembly line. I can but I, I will lose interest in it. Um, and I think that's really kind of what got us thinking, 
you know, if I was going to come and consult on your business, Joe, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assign myself a job because it's not my company. It's yours. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assign myself to be your outbound caller because I got to go back to my own business. Yeah. And I think as we started coaching and consulting other people, it's like, man, we need to take our own advice. Um, we need this. It's not really a business if we assign every single role to ourselves. Yeah, it's really good. It's, it's asking bigger and better questions. You guys are, are really, really good at that. Um, we got about five or 10 more minutes. And uh, what do you guys, what does your business look like today? Uh, you're, I want to talk more about your, you're actually traveling more and you're speaking more and you're training people and you're having tremendous success with students way higher than the normal average. Uh, we've sat and talked about this before over sushi and uh, it's pretty amazing what you have going on. Talk a little bit about um, uh, what are you seeing as you're traveling and you're speaking to people, what are you seeing that's working well for them? What are you teaching people? What are you, what are the most important things that you're, you're training them on right now? Does that make sense? Um, I, I would say for me, the, the biggest, like where we always start with somebody is, and it sounds really simple, but it's conditioning yourself to take massive action um, and really committing to what it is that you say you really want. You know, us being introduced to creating visions for our lives and visions for our business. And then that business um, is designed to serve that personal vision that you have um, was life-changing for us. And no it doubt. is something that we have carried in everything that we've done and it always comes first. And so once you make, you know, once that vision's created, you're committing to that. And I'm not going to say, you know, I don't like to sell the dream that, you know, you write it down, this is your vision. And then like this, everything starts happening. You know, you, you have to put in, I call it the hustle period. You have to really work, but that, that hustle time, that reward is so big, but it takes a lot of massive action in the moment. Once you make that commitment and for so many people, I see they have all these opportunities in front of them, but they've not conditioned themselves to act, 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 act. Even if you don't know what you should be acting on. Do the wrong thing instead of no to thing. Do yeah. something. Yes. That's good. Good, good. Were you going to say something, Jason? I was just going to say that I think the other side of that is, is we try to do a good job of putting students, putting people in an environment where there's almost forced accountability. Uh, meaning that when you're at your day job and you don't turn in your work, you get fired, right? I mean, you, you get written up, you do it again, you get fired. There's consequences. <laughs> yeah, there's consequences. In our own businesses, in our own self-employment, um, there isn't, there, there is a consequence, but we don't see it. It's, it's not a, it's not an immediate consequence. It work, we don't come in, we get fired, immediate consequence over here. We don't work, we don't see it, but the reality that's happening, I mean, the consequence that's really happening is that you're not changing your life. Everything's gonna be the same. And in 10 years, you're still gonna be going into that nine to five that you hate. Um, but it's a delayed, unseen consequence, I think. And so- that's, that's such a good point. Really, really good point. Like, so what are some of the things you do as a coach to force that accountability? Um, one, of the, one of the fun things that we like to do is, is create, painful consequences you know we let the student kind of pick but or reward right because or reward, people, but are people will, inspired. Most people will are always move away from pain quicker than they'll move yeah. towards pleasure so rewards are great and i think that you should reward the success that you have because i think it conditions you to have more success so i think it it's, you thrive for it's more. good but when you really have to get in the habit of doing something that you know people say for 10 years i want to diet i want to work out and then and they don't do anything about it and then miraculously one day they start dropping weight and they're healthy um nothing really changed in that 10 year period of time other than the commitment level changed right they didn't like learn some new secret or anything they just they just made a decision to do things differently so i think we try to create an environment where the pain of not doing it is greater than the pain or the uncomfortableness of doing it, right? Like I, I get you work a you work a nine to five, you're working 40, 50 hours a week and you get home. Sometimes the last thing on earth you want to do is skip trace some phone numbers and sit on the phone for an hour or two when your wife is you haven't seen her all day and your kids are running around. They haven't seen their dad and you know what I mean? Like I get it. Um but I think a, a short term limited sacrifice now 
to be able to, you know, possibly in a year or two from now, be able to be at home and take your kids to school every morning and pick them up every day and, um, you know, work two or three days a week instead of seven. Um, I think that's probably a pretty good trade-off. Yeah. So what, and our what are some of very much around that, our small group accountabilities, you know, we really, that accountability, it's so imperative. What are some examples of, of pain consequences that you or your coaching clients will give themselves? Oh, dude. Um, well, that are, I'll give that you are clean. Uh, that are clean, Jason. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I will give you one. Um, <laughs> personal health and fitness has kind of been something that in the mortgage business, I mean, really forever, um, we worked a lot of hours. We ate primarily fast food and there wasn't time for the gym. And so I was one of those guys that for 10 years said that I want to be healthier. I want to work out. I want to do those kind of things. And I never, never did. Um, and finally, when I went through that kind of vision process, you know, my gym appointment got put on my calendar for 2.30 every day because that was the point where I was gonna stop working for the day and I was gonna go to the gym. And I don't know how many years it's been now, I don't five, six years that I consistently go three to five times a week, every single week at that 2.30 spot, no matter what anybody that's close to me or that I coach knows that if, you know, if we have a half day, it ends at two because I go to the gym at 2.30. Um, it's just something that, has been important. However, I, I wasn't really doing any cardio. And so I made a commitment to our coaching group um, that I would lose, I think it was like 20 pounds by our next retreat. And uh, about a week and a half out of that commitment, I was right at the 20 pound loss. I mean, I was there and I had a, like a week and a half left. And then on a whim, at the last minute, we decided to go to Grant Cardone's, his last 10X conference. And so we flew to Miami and I like to eat. I like nice restaurants. We like to try new restaurants, new food, new culture. Like that's something that I enjoy. And so of course, you know, we're at every seafood and steakhouse and cool restaurant that we can find in Miami for that time. And by the time we got back, I was like one or two pounds over my goal. And so, uh, I sat in the middle of our mastermind and um, everybody took clippers and shaved all my hair off bald, which may not bother some people, but I, uh, it, it, it bothered me. His hair is um, a pretty big deal to have. So. That was a, um, <laughs> that was a, that was a extremely painful consequence for me. So I think I kind of, matters the person too, you know, what, what motivates different. them. I mean, we, uh, we had one of the girls in our group write a letter. Uh, she had a, a medical condition and it was, it was a serious medical condition, a medical condition that if she didn't clean up her diet would have significantly negatively impacted her for the rest of her life to the point where she couldn't do normal daily things with her children. But if she did clean her diet up, she would probably, there was a chance she would probably be completely fine. And she was struggling with finding the motivation to just eat right, um, a consequence that was big enough. And as we started to dig down deeper, we realized, you know, her, her family and her children were, were the most important things to her. And so I had her sit down and write a letter to her children that basically said, um, sorry, guys, but, you know, I'm selfish and I, I don't care about you guys enough to change these these habits that I have. I don't care about you enough to spend my future with you. I, I more care about myself and just be, I mean, it was really hard, dude. I mean, I was, I had tears. She had tears. I mean, it was basically a le writing a letter to your children saying, I don't care about you. Good luck in life. I mean, as a parent, um, I think that's probably one of the most painful things you could think about doing is telling your kids that I don't really love you. I don't really care about you. It was all kind of a joke. I, I'm really a selfish person. All I care about is myself kind of thing. And the agreement was, if she didn't make those changes by the next retreat, she was going to have to bring them in the room and read that letter to them in front of everyone. And she instantly was like, I will never, ever let that happen. There is no way in hell I'm going to read that letter, you know, and, and she changed. I mean, she changed a habit that she hadn't been able to change for six or seven years and she changed wow. it in 120 days. Yeah. So I, I think it's, wow. I think it's impactful to find out what that, trigger is and if you really really want something right I mean if you don't want it don't do it but if you really really want change if you really really want something different then paint yourself in a corner because I think when 
when we're forced to show up, we show up, you know? Mm. That's really good. It's, it's true for me. It's true for me. All right. So um, how can guys get a hold of you? You guys travel and speak and do events, um, but you also have, uh, you have some online stuff that people can get. Um, talk about real quick, where are you going to be speaking next? Do you have any ideas or plans yet? And then yep. how can people find you online? Our next three-day boot camp, which is our favorite thing that we do. We don't bring in outside selling speakers. There's no one in there pitching products or court. And I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, I'm, I went to 10X and probably spent 10,000 bucks on, I, 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 I want to constantly <laughs> educate myself. I'm just differentiating that this three-day boot camp isn't a pitch fest. It is three full days of nothing but content. And it's our favorite. We have a blast. It's our favorite thing that we do. I mean, that lives are lives get changed in that room um, every time we do it. Our next one is January 31st, February 1st, and February 2nd in Kansas City. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Yep. Um, Harris, KC North, I yep. think is where we're doing that. Nice. Um, so yeah, again, we... just repeat those dates. The end of January, first few days in February in Kansas City, Missouri. Yep. January 31st, February 1, February 2. Good. And where can people go to get more information about that? Man, I think the best place to go is go to our Facebook page. It's just REI -E Blueprint. Um, we have a ton of training content on there. All of our event dates and registration are, are on there. Um, if you are planning on coming to the January one, I would recommend getting on there quickly because uh, we normally we, we normally try to cap our events at 100 people and we always hit 100. So um it's we, we've made it inexpensive we've made it ridiculously cheap um i mean it, it is definitely i don't know I, I i hear people say stuff sometimes and it sounds cliche but i i don't feel like god put us at least us you know me uh on this earth to, to flip houses i mean it's always been a vehicle for us um and you know i, I get on stage and i say I'm not this crazy passionate about real estate guy. And sometimes the owner of the RIA kind of looks at me like, what the hell are you doing here then? Um, and and it, I think it's that I share, um, it's a vehicle, man. It's a vehicle that uh, that makes a lot of money in a short amount of time and allows us to spend our time doing what we're here to do, what we enjoy doing. And we have found a lot of personal enjoyment and taking people that, grew up in, you know, kind of lower middle class incomes and teaching them how to have a life they never ever thought that they could have. Like, like yeah. you've done. Um, taking somebody that's been in corporate America for 20 years and their marriage has fallen apart and in a year and a half time, they've, they've paid their car off, they've paid their house off and they quit their $100,000 a year IT job um, and they're able to experience life now. I mean, Flipping houses is fun, but there's nothing more rewarding than, than really having a the big impact. Yeah. Right when you build it right. That's good. So do you have any other events planned after that yet? Yeah, we'll be in uh, Wisconsin first weekend of May. Um, nice. We'll have a boot camp there. We're speaking a little in St. Louis in March. Um, yeah. And then we kind of roll into, we'll be Atlanta, Florida in June. So yeah, we've got that events page updated with, with everything um, for registration. Good, good. And uh, again, the best way to reach you guys is through your Facebook page. Just look up REI Blueprint, right? Yep. Yep. You can go to reiblueprint.com, but we really put most of our, our content and training and, you know, we update more of the Facebook page probably than the website. Good. Nice. Well, thanks, Jason and Rachel, for being on the show. Sure appreciate it. And I look forward to, um, we need to have lunch again or a coffee or something pretty soon yeah, with absolutely. you guys. And um, so... Again, guys, go to Facebook, do a search for REI Blueprint. You'll find Jason and Rachel there. I highly recommend these guys. You know, if you have anything that they have said that's resonated with you guys, you need to go to one of their three-day boot camps. I've heard from other people um, outside of, of what, who Jason and Rachel have connected me with that their events are life-changing and they have a huge impact. Their students have a lot of success personally and business. So it's, I, I just really encourage you all to check them out. They're good people. Even though they're from St. Louis, <laughs> they're, they're good people. So um, thanks again, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all later. We'll take care. Joey, you're awesome, man. Yeah, thanks thank for having us, so brother. Much. We appreciate thanks. it. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye.